Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. We appreciate it. Um, tonight is a very special shear. Tonight is shear 154 with Coach Menachem Bernfeld. Again, we'd like to start off every week thanking all the sponsors and people that know, tell people about the program, especially our viewers. They post it on the WhatsApp statuses and they let people know about it. They email it up and um, that's it's, it's a Sikha Saverim. We're doing this close to four years. We're almost on our fourth year anniversary. It's coming up soon. And um, again, thank you for everybody for posting. Like I say every week, not every program might be for you specifically, but there's a lot of people that it is for. So post it, let people know about it. You never know if you're helping somebody by doing that. If anybody wants to join our WhatsApp chats, you could WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066. Save my number. And every Sunday, Mr. Shem, I'll send you the flyer to speak of that week and all the information. Or you can go to menachembernfeld.com and sign up for his weekly email flyer list and the replay list and all the information that's going on behind the scenes with Coach Menachem. All the people that are watching this on YouTube, the replay, you can click on the subscribe button to subscribe to Coach Menachem. You can also uh, click on the like button so more people get views and the program keeps on growing more and more. I'd like this first, start off thanking all the advertising sponsors. First, Lakewood Scoopier on Lakewood, Ellie Nario from Five Town Central, and Chayla Kaufman from JCN for promoting us on all the Jewish digital platforms. For Anybody who's here the first time, first of all, I don't know where you have been. This program has been already four years, so thank you for joining, first of all. But uh, every Sunday night, we have this beautiful program. Metchem next week, August 20th, 7th. is going to be an amazing shear from Rav Yitzchak Schwartz. He's very actually close to Chavrusa and neighbor, and he's a Rav, or Rav Shimon Russell. He's from Kibat Zev and Eretz Yisrael. Menachem, what's the topic that he decided you spoke with him today? What's the topic he's going to be talking about? We'll have to find out at the end. We'll find out. So we're going to keep it a surprise. So it should be powerful, meaningful, let everybody know, join, be part of it. Um, and tonight we have the schos and honor of having world-famous Ramanitz Friedman, who's been on the shir many, many times. We actually had a big share with him on anxiety, which was our biggest share that we had with you, Ramanitz. It was people all over the world keep on asking for that share. So we got to do another mental health topic and really cover that. Uh, but tonight, Mitchell, we have another important topic, and hopefully Mitchell will be a lot of, lot of parents, a lot of people, the relationships, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, really get into it. Tonight's share is 154. I'm going to pass it over to Coach Menachem Bernfeld. Oner Echfried is traveling. He's not with us. So, Coach Menachem, what does 154 have to do with tonight's share? So, um, first of all, we miss our Noyach. Um, 154 is a good matter. Kona. 154. Kona in English is a read. And um, to see how we can shape our relationships in a way, in a healthy way, so it doesn't become hard and stiff and then it's much harder to to um, fix the relationship so basically when the kids are younger when they're still young that's the time to create that relationship so eventually when they get older you have it okay so coach i'm not going to go back to you oh. here tonight with Romanus. what's the topic what are we talking about what's the outline why, why are we all gathered here tonight Beautiful. So welcome everyone to another Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem Baruch Hashem, Lara Siyat Deshmaya, 154. Um, hard work and Baruch Hashem, we're here. Happy to be here and a lot of information, especially coming off last week's topic, which wasn't an easy one. And uh, the questions that came in, the real, real questions, and hopefully everyone can have a support group, you know, where we try to get some people to get together over here as much as possible to get the support they need, but eventually coming Sunday night is not enough, you know, to have the right place, the right people to talk to that can help them, especially last week's topic. And tonight's topic is also not an easy one. Talking about relationships, whether the kids are younger or when they get older, many people are struggling. And there's a lot of levels, but people are really having a hard time. There are people who are very painful. Some do talk, don't talk once in a while. They don't have a relationship. They would love to have a better relationship. It always, when it comes to these topics, not easy. And uh, hopefully Robert Friedman will be able to clarify some things, which I feel always when you come on to make things clear. What are we looking for? But before we start, I, I think personally it's a good time before Rosh Hashanah. Discussing relationships, I think it works in general, whether it's a relationship with yourself, 
with your parents, with your kids, and it takes us to a relationship with Hashem when we're very young. The, you know, who do we have? We have the adults in our life, our, our parents, and whatever they say, we pick up. Whatever they say, we believe. And uh, talking about Hashem, you know, for younger kids, hard the concept. So sometimes we, the way we look at our parents, it's pretty similar that we look at Hashem that way. And when things don't work, uh, it doesn't work out the right way, and um, which many times happens, it could get messed up a little bit, our relationship with Hashem, especially now when it comes to connecting Elul, the Rosh Hashanah, connecting to ourselves, seeing where we are with our, our relationship with Hashem, it could get a little bit, um, well, we can get a little bit stuck. Many people can get stuck. So again, everybody has their things, you know, before we get married, we come from somewhere, we have family and relationship we have then. Then we get married hoping that we're going to do the right way. And then many come with their baggage to marriage. And it's not that we should wait till we figure everything out and then get married. We do get married young. And we many of us have things to work out and we work it out after marriage. And then we become aware of certain mistakes, maybe things that we should do different. And then we have those who have beautiful families, Baruch Hashem, and the Chinuch is amazing. And then we have one child that just doesn't click. And then we're not sure how, what are we supposed to do? And we had different programs on that. But again, it's we're human. We're trying our best and our parents tried their best. And many times the kids become aware become aware of what we picked up, our beliefs about ourselves, beliefs on, on relationships in general, our relationship with Hashem, and we start questioning. And many times questioning takes us on a journey. It takes us on a journey, and while we're on that journey, it's not always that nice, you know, sometimes to heal. While we're healing, it's hard for both sides of the relationship. So here we are tonight having discussion, that topic. Hopefully we'll be able to clarify a little bit of what we're looking for, what we could do to make things a little bit lighter, a little bit easier. And uh, I want to welcome you, Rabbi Manus Friedman, to be with us again. And it's a schos and a mitzvah shem. We should be able to take one question at a time, one person at a time, and help us on our healing journey, mitzvah shem. Shkoyach. Shkoyach, Okay, so let's get into the overview of tonight's share. So again, the topic of the share is nurturing eternal bonds, unveiling the art of sustaining rela re resilient relationships, especially as they become adult children through effective communication and emotional connections. That's the topic, but we're going to talk about in general relationships, connections, dealing with people. It's a very broad topic. And the Mitzvah tonight's share for Solar Nech asked us to do the Zeich Nishmas' mother, who's the yard this week, Chayalei Abbas Reb David Shol, Christmas for the Neshama, and his is also Reb David Ben Naftali Tzvi. And also, I'm gonna do is chus my father who's still I'm still with Rosh Hashanah. He was just nifter. Rav Moshe Yamin Ben David Shmuel is Neshama Shav and Aliyah. And I'm gonna read Rav Manus's bio, and then uh, he's gonna open it up for the Olam. And we have a lot of questions, and uh, the Olam should uh, really chop Ryan and grill him. So that's why he's here. Okay, Rav Manus Friedman, world-renowned author. I'm gonna read your bio, okay, Rav Manus? You don't have to. Uh, the Olam, I like to. Is it okay? If you like it. Okay, Ravanas Friedman, not every, not everybody, I mean, most people know you, but just in case somebody doesn't know you. World-renowned author, counselor, lecturer, philosopher, Ravanas uses ancient wisdom and modern wit as he cap captivates audience around the country and the world. He's widely recognized throughout his approach from, to almost every, every major issue that flags society from self-awareness, spirituality, mysticism, parenting, marriage. Evidence of his regard is displayed through thousands of students, fans, and individuals who deeply respect his wisdom. When he takes the podium, Rabbi Friedman enthusiasts each and listener with a sense of purpose and defined direction of Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi Friedman has written five books with more ways and has been featured on CNN, PBS, BBC, A&E, and TEDx. And of course, more importantly, Coach Menachem. And his claim to fame as being YouTube's most famous rabbi with over 300,000 followers listening to his daily con content. And Rabbi Friedman was also on the front page of, uh, the, I think it was Amit Meshbacha magazine with his brother this week. So uh, we got we got you at the right time. So uh, Reverend Freeman, it's supposed to have you open it up. 
to the, the floor. Give us a little opening, and then we're going to get into the questions, okay? Well, the opening is a very, very, um, a very challenging and very heavy subject that affects almost everybody and in every way. In life itself. But here's the fundamental question. Before we move on to anything else, we have to ask ourselves, how is this legitimate? For example, Adam and Chava, they're in the Garden of Eden, in Gan Eden. And Hashem says to them, Mikol eats Hagan Ochel Techo. You can eat from all the trees of the garden. Why was that necessary? The main thing the Ebishta wanted to say is that the Eitz Hadas you shouldn't eat. But why did he have to say that from all the other trees you may eat? If, if he hadn't said it, if Hashem had not said you can eat from all the trees, what would Adam and Chava have done? when they got hungry. Now the human assumption is, well, they would eat. They're hungry, there's fruit, they would eat. But that's not correct. They would not eat. They wouldn't eat because it's not their fruit. It's not their tree. So to say that they would help themselves to somebody else's fruit because they were hungry, they would never do that. Never. So what would they do? Die of hunger. In other words, they did not put their own survival and their own lives above the the right and wrong of whose trees are they. This idea that pikuach nefesh is deicha every mitzvah, except for the three biggies, the idea that pikuach nefesh is deicha Shabbos and Yom Kippur and Kashrus, that's a chidush. It's not correct to say, well, of course. Of course you should be machal Shabbos. You have to save a life. Of course you should eat on Yom Kippur. You have to save a life. It's not so simple. It's a chidush. It's a gzedas hakosuv that is not that's as mysterious as as the chukim. You can't start off by saying there are rules of right and wrong, and Hashem has to play by those rules. The world was created out of nothing. There were no rules. There is no right. There's no wrong. There's no up. There's no down. There's no holy and there's no unholy until Hashem invents it. What he doesn't like is not holy and what he does like is holy. Not the other way around. It's not that he likes what is holy. His liking it makes it holy and his dislike or distaste makes it unholy. So, we can't, we can't create a moral code and then be surprised that Hashem doesn't follow our moral code. So here's, here's the, the question that is relevant to our conversation. How many times a day do we daven? Three times a day. Three times a day you are asking Hashem for what you need. How do we justify this? How is this justified? You bother the Ebushta three times a day because you need Parnosa? How does that make any sense? So unless Hashem says, if you're in pain, If you're anxious, if you're worried, talk to me. Unless he asks that we do that, we would never have the chutzpah to think. If I need something, I can knock on his door any time of the day. Why? Because I need it?
we hesitate sometimes to call a doctor in the middle of the night. I'd wake a guy up, never. What, because I'm worried because I have a stomach ache? Okay, so we know that to ask for your needs, like prim- primarily uh, Rifua and Parnasa, were allowed, and, and not only allowed, but the Ebrishta wants us to ask him. It's a mitzvah. But now let's talk about emotional needs. Can we put our emotional needs before the mitzvahs? You want to live, you want to be happy, you want to have nachas from your children. Are we justified in pursuing those things, demanding them from Hashem? We've got we to gotta think about that. Where do I fit into the picture? How do I justify my quetching, my complaining, my, my, my unhappiness with how things are going? So again, we assume, like the default position is, if you're upset, complain. If you're hurting, scream. It's, it's not, you now we had this experience, we were sitting in a big class, we were studying something, talking about something, and then suddenly one of the women started to cry. She had a problem that in shul people are not nice to her, and she was crying bitter tears. Of course, everybody was sympathetic. But one woman said to her, this is not the place, this is not the time. This is a room full of people. They came here to learn. They came here to discuss. Why do you think they all have to listen to your heartache? And that started a big debate in the, you know, you got to be more sympathetic and But, the, but there is a debate. There are two sides to the story. So what, what justifies our, what gives us the right to be miserable? We would have to have permission for this. Just like the Adam and Chava had to have permission to eat from a tree. Or if you're going to build yourself a house, because you need a shelter. So you chop down a bunch of trees and build yourself a log cabin? Whose trees are you chopping down? You're cold and you want to put some fire in the, in the, in the fireplace? Whose wood are you burning? It's not so simple. There's a joke about uh, an atheist who says to the Ebrishta, we used to need you when we were primitive. But now that we're sophisticated and we have technology, we don't need you anymore because we can do whatever you do. So Hashem says, you can make a man out of dust? He says, yes, we have the technology. Hashem says, go ahead, let me see. So he starts gathering up some dust and Hashem says to him, no, 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 not my dust. You have the technology to turn dust into a human being, but you can't create dust. So whose dust are you using? Whose wood are you burning? Whose fruits are you eating? So here's a beautiful idea. There's a bracha we make every morning, like almost first thing in the morning. The bracha is, Baruch HaToh Hashem Elekeinu Melech HaOilam Matir Asurin. Matir Asurim means he unties those who are tied, bound. Referring to a person who is asleep, who can't move, and when he wakes up, his bonds are are opened and he can move again. So God unties those who are bound. It needs a little more explanation because a person who's sleeping is not bound, he doesn't want to move, he wants to sleep peacefully. So, 
a deeper thought on the bracha is, Baruch Ato Hashem Elikeinu Melech HaOilam, Matir Isurim. The first thing in the morning that we have to recognize is that the Ebeshter permits what is forbidden. What's forbidden? Everything. Because nothing in this world is ours. So what do you mean? You take wood and you burn it? You pick a fruit and you eat it? But the Ebeshter was matir. The Ebeshter tells us you can enjoy the world, you can use whatever you need. He is matir things that really should be forbidden because they're not ours. So before we do anything, we have to ask ourselves, where do we get, where do we get the right, the permission, the chutzpah? If we could teach this to our children, the children would have such a more pleasant life and would be healthier. Children who feel entitled are not healthy. They're certainly not happy. So the Torah says, raise a child according to his style, according to his understanding, according to his way. So that even when he grows old, those teachings will stay with him, he won't lose it. The question is, what teaching do you give a child that you don't want him to outgrow? What is it you teach a child according to a child's understanding and you want it to last into old age? So there's a difference between things that are childish and things that are childlike. Childish, you want to outgrow quickly. Childlike is beautiful, and you should never lose it. Like, for example, emuna, optimism, excitement in life, the enjoyment of life. You don't want to ever lose that. So there are, cho- there are people who are adults, and their, their, their life is enviable. They have this childlike innocence, this childlike enthusiasm for life. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. No one should lose that. Childlike, not childish. So what is it that we can teach a child that will last a lifetime? And we're not talking about how to wash Neglavasar. That's not Alpi Darkai. It has nothing to do with a child and adult. It's the same Neglavasar. There is something about a child that he needs to hear that will last a lifetime. What he needs to hear is, it's not about you. You're a child. It's not about you. Your parents are good to you. Eberstedt is good to you. The community is good to you. Maybe not always. Maybe not exactly the way you want. But your life is made up of everybody else more than it is you. It's not about you. Because as an infant, there is the impression that it is about me. Look at this. Everybody runs around me. Everybody is smiling to me. Everybody wants to feed me. Everybody wants to hold me. It seems like my existence, my life is all about me. Even the people around me are there for me. So the first thing you do when you are mechanich, the child, the beginnings of all chinuch is, no, it's not about you. So if you were Adam 
in the in Gan Eden, you would not eat from the tree because it's not about you. It's about the balabos of Gan Eden, the owner of the tree. If we could at least partially implant that in our own mind, in our own heart, and certainly in our children's mind and heart, that would last a lifetime. And not just one lifetime, but that would be passed on to the grandchildren and to the great-grandchildren. That's, that's godliness. Godliness means I didn't create the world, so it's not about me. It's about what I can offer and what I could contribute. So you know that famous quote, if you raise your children properly, then you can spoil your grandchildren. But if you, ra if you spoil your children, you're going to have to raise your grandchildren, and you're too old for that. <laughs> if you raise your children, they will pass on what you taught them to their children, and you can sit back and pamper the kids, spoil them, the grandkids. But if you spoil your children and you don't teach them that it's not about you, then they're not going to have what to raise their children with. And you're going to have to raise them. So why wait until you have grandchildren? Give it to your children. They'll give it to the grandchildren, and you'll be able to enjoy being a Bobby and a Zaidi, and you can spoil your grandchildren. When your children are grown up, they need respect. You can't start raising them after they're grown up. Whatever you taught them, whatever you gave them when they were children, those are the seeds you planted. Trust them. If they were good seeds, they will produce the proper fruit or flower. Even if you don't see it yet, you have to be confident that the seeds are good, they're healthy, they're the right seeds, they will produce the right results. Stop raising your children once they're adults. Now they need your approval and your admiration. That will make their life more livable or livable. If you keep trying to raise them, it creates a lot of tension. It means that you're not pleased with them, that you don't like how they turned out because you're still trying to change them. And that's a, that's a negative, bad message. Once they hit 20, or some say 18, you stop raising them, and you stop start praising them. Approve of how they turned out. For whatever it is you can find approval for. Like the Bardichever, who saw a guy eating on Tisha B'Av, and he said, oh, did you forget it's Tisha B'av? He says, no. He says, did you forget that you're not allowed to eat on Tisha B'av? He says, no, I didn't forget. He says, did a doctor tell you that you have to eat on Tisha B'av? He says, no, I'm perfectly healthy. So he turns to the Eberstein and he says, Eberstein, your children are so wonderful. Even caught red-handed, they don't lie. You, you, you find something to admire in your children, whatever it is. And you never get over it. That's how you treat an adult child. If you really want to score big, ask your adult child for advice. That's a home run. You make them feel like a real mensch doesn't mean you have to listen to their advice. You never have to listen to anybody's advice. 
It's not a commandment. But asking for advice, taking into consideration their opinion or their view, very, very positive. Very good thing to do. Now, on that note, there is something about today's children never before. Never before were children so intelligent, so independent, with such mature opinions on every subject in the world. So at what age should we start talking to children as if they were adults? Nine? Ten for sure? It doesn't mean you give them authority. It means you speak to them like adults. You don't baby them. You don't talk down to them. Remember one of my kids growing up, you know, they listened to all the, the children's records with stories read by different people. With one record, one of my kids turned around and said, why does he talk like a baby? <laughs> the guy who made the record when was speaking child language. And then the, and the kids were, why do you, why is he talking like a baby? Children are very smart these days. It can be scary. One more, one more Naha story. I'm driving one of my granddaughters. She's seven years old. She's in the back seat. We're driving in her hometown. And she says, I want a Slurpee. I said, great. We'll stop and we'll get you a Slurpee. She says, mommy doesn't let. I said, I am mommy's tati. And I am your grandfather and my job is to spoil you. So we're going to stop and get you a Slurpee. The seven-year-old in the back seat says, just because you want something doesn't mean you have to have it. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, okay. Maybe you want to drive? You're more mature than me. Kids today are absolutely amazing. And you can't talk down to them. You can't. So even at a young age of seven and eight, you have to take their questions seriously. You have to answer like a mensch. By the age of nine and 10, you got to speak to them like adults. Don't dismiss them. Don't ignore them. You wouldn't do that with an adult. So it became very clear talking to parents with today's children, if you say to a child, sit quietly and don't make trouble, be a good boy. Today's children are way too, I don't know what the word, they're not mature, but they're, they're precocious. You say to a child, sit quietly and don't make trouble be a good boy and the child thinks that's a good boy sit quietly and don't make trouble is a good boy it's a good dog a dog that sits quietly and doesn't make trouble is a good dog what makes that a good boy they want to be challenged they want to feel useful at a very young age. So if you want to have a good relationship with your children, treat them age appropriately. Don't baby them when they're old enough to stop and don't try to raise them when they're already grown up. What is the message? What does it mean to raise children? To raise a child means to liberate them from their addiction to themselves. 
you know, we do it all the time, unconsciously. When you say to a child, it's time to go to sleep, child says, I don't want to. And you say, but it's late, it's bedtime. What did you just say? The child says, I don't want to. And your answer is, it's time. You're, you're conveying a very important message. Whether you want to or you don't want to, when it's time, it's time. Your child wants to take a toy home from his friend's house, and you say, no, it's not your toy. The child says, but I want it. And you say, yes, but it's not your toy. What are you saying? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about right and wrong. Whose toy is it? You want to? That doesn't decide. That doesn't determine who the, who the toy belongs to and who gets to take it home. So in, in, in so many different ways, raising a child means it's not all about you. In the secular world, in modern psychology, you're given the opposite message. Everything is about you. Do you want to eat now? Do you want to eat this? You want to eat it now? You want to eat it here? You want to eat it with a fork? You want to eat it with a spoon? One time in my life as a teenager, I made this mistake and I never made it again. I came home from yeshiva and I asked my mother, who was a very wise woman, I asked my mother, what's for supper? I never asked again. <laughs> I asked my mother, what's for supper? My mother said, food. Food. If you want to eat it, you can. If you don't want to, don't. There's food available. Oh, but is it my kind of food? Is it the way I like it? Is it on the plate that I want? No, it's not about you, it's about food. We don't do our children any, any good or any service by constantly catering to needs they don't even feel like they have. Why do you have to create needs? Oh, do you want ketchup with that? Why, why do you have to ask that? If a child wants ketchup, he'll get up and get ketchup. Don't make a big deal about it. So what is the message that raises a child? The message that it's not about you. What is Rosh Hashanah? Very simple. During the year, I may have gotten a little distracted and I may have gotten a little caught up in my things and my affairs and in my needs. And I started to act like it's about me. Comes Rosh Hashanah and we become keenly aware. It's not about me. Not about me. Today, Hashem will decide who will succeed and who will not, who will live and who will not, who will prosper and who will suffer. Not about me. The theme of Rosh Hashanah is, this is your creation. This is your world. This is your plan. I'm, I'm here to, 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 to partner with you, not to dictate to you, not to make demands of you. So what are we doing a whole day, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Doesn't it sound like, give me, give me, give me? Zochreinu l'chayim. 
kosveinu l'chayim. On, over and over and over. It sounds really greedy and petty. That's not Rosh Hashanah. So I got to share with you this incredible incident. One of the famous chassidim in Russia who survived communism, who defied communism, one of these heroes bigger than life, he finally managed to escape and he came to England and from England he came fetishly to the Rebbe in Brooklyn. He walked into the base medish. We were sitting and learning. He, wa- he waddles over and he sits down on the bench with us and he says, let's see, what, what are you learning? What are you discussing? And he took a look at the text and he saw the words Cheshben Hanefesh. So he says, ah, Chesh ben HaNefesh, like on Yom Kippur. How do you make a Chesh ben HaNefesh? Because we weren't going to answer. He says, you think about all the sins you committed in last Tishrei, and then you think about all the sins you committed in Chesh then you remind yourself of all the sins you committed in Kislev, and you go through the whole year like that and ask forgiveness for all of those sins. And we said, yeah. He said, fe, fe. On the holiest day of the year, you sit and think about your sins? You're thinking sins a whole day, even the sins you forgot, you dredge them up. This is how you become cleansed? We were, we were stunned. <laughs> wow. Just pull the rug out right from under us. He says, nah, nah, nah. Let, me, let me tell you. Chesh Nefesh is like this. First, you think about everything that Hashem did for you in Tishrei. Then you think about everything Hashem did for you in Cheshru. Then you think about everything Hashem did for you in Kislev. And you go through the whole year. And then by Ne'ilah, you ask yourself, and what did I do for him? That's Tshuva. If we... If we focus on our faults, if we focus on the ugliness, how, is, how are we going to get any nicer? If we focus on our own needs, how are we going to grow up? Now, of course, you don't dismiss people's pain. You don't dismiss their opinion. You don't dismiss their needs emotional needs, physical needs. But to live for those needs? Even on Yom Kippur, you're going to talk about your own needs? So when is there going to be a holy day? What day of the year do you not focus on yourself? Never? That's not a good chinuch. So speaking about relationships with family members, Ed of Rosh Hashanah or in Tish, or in Elul, very appropriate. Gemara says that God said, if they're not going to honor their parents, what chance do I have of them honoring me? If you can't even feel grateful, indebted to your parents, the creators that you can see, how are you going to feel grateful and indebted to the Ebushta, the creator that you can't see? So the way your relationship with your parents goes, that's how your relationship with Hashem goes. So 
So, number one, if you're raising children, you have to stop raising yourself. Meaning, you're developing a relationship with your children as an adult, as parents. You can't at the same time be working on your relationship with your parents as their children. You can't be a child and a parent at the same time. If you're still trying to work out your relationship with your parents, you're not really available to your children. So what do you do about your displeasure with your parents, with the way they raised you, how they treated you? And I'm not talking about criminal behavior. I'm talking about the average parent who was guilty of many oversights, many failings, many bad moves in raising their children and raising you. What do you do with that? So the Torah says, Al ken yaziv ish as oviv as imay, Therefore, a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and become basar echad. How do you get married? How do you become attached to your spouse? Let go of your parents. What does that mean? It doesn't mean become estranged. It means stop trying to fix that relationship. Whatever the relationship is, it's good enough. How is it good enough? Parents, by strict definition, are the people who gave you life, not the people who taught you how to ride a bicycle. Anyone can teach you how to ride a bicycle. Parents are not the ones who teach you how to brush your teeth. Anyone can teach you how to brush your teeth. The only thing parents do for you that no one else can do for you is give birth to you, give you life. On rare occasion, they will sacrifice their comfort, their money, maybe even their lives, which nobody else will do. But that's, that's emergency, that's rare. In everyday life, what your parents gave you that no one else can give you is that they gave birth to you and help you live. If they weren't good in psychology, if they weren't good at communication, if they weren't good at uh, training, and that doesn't make them less of a parent. makes them less of a teacher, maybe even less of a role model, but not less of a parent. So your, your mitzvah to honor them is not dependent on what else they did. You honor them because they gave birth to you. So what about all of those things that hurt you? The only way to handle that is to entitle them. This is, this is a strange idea, but it's, it's something to think about. You entitle them. You don't forgive them for their mistakes. You entitle them to their mistakes. If someone saved your life, but then didn't know how to dress you properly, they're entitled to make mistakes in how to dress because they gave you life. After giving you life, they're entitled to make a lot of mistakes in everything else. And you still owe them. And they're still your parents. You, on the other hand, 
didn't give your mother anything except nine miserable months of, of, of morning sickness. So you are not entitled to make any mistakes in how you treat your mother. That's why parents are always on a pedestal. You can't compete with them. The first time I heard from a teenage girl, well, my mother doesn't respect me, so why should I respect her? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How do we get so far from the truth, so distorted? Your mother needs to respect you? For what you've done? What have you done? You ate her food? What have you done? Parents always have to be on a pedestal. We're not here to criticize them, to judge them. They're untouchable. That's why you're not allowed to call them by their first name. Too familiar. You're not on the same level. This is not a friend you're talking to. That's kibbud Ava'im. Basically, the point remains the same point always. It's not about you. Parents gave birth to you. It was not about them. They gave life. They didn't take life. Because we know it's not just me. It's not enough that I will grow up and I will be prosperous and I will be happy. What have I done for anybody else? What other life have I given? Who else benefited from my existence? That's what it's about. And that children trying to please their parents, that should never stop. You move on, pleasing your parents, pleasing your teacher, pleasing the Ebershta. Because it's always about somebody else. So here's a scary thought. If a child is undisciplined, if a child says to his parents, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. If we don't do something about that, the next step will be that when they go to school, they'll have the same attitude towards the teacher. Teacher can't tell me what to do. If that doesn't get fixed, then um, the policeman can't tell me what to do. The government can't tell me what to do. The traitor can't tell me what to do. God can't tell me what to do. That's what happens to a child who is not disciplined. And what does discipline mean? Convinced that it's not about you. That's discipline doesn't mean spanking. But it doesn't end there. Here's, here's the shocking thing. The child seems to be so independent. Parents, not the boss of me. Teachers, not the boss of me. Policemen, not the boss of me. Nobody is my boss. I do what I want. But here's the catch. After you come to us to a stage where even God can't tell you what to do, there's one further development, one more stage. Now you can't tell yourself what to do. Now you, now you get stuck in addictions. You can't tell yourself what to do. You can say it. You can say, oh, I don't want to do this. I shouldn't be doing this. You do it anyway, because you are not the boss of you. I think that's a pretty accurate description of today's 
youth. It's not that they won't listen to anybody. They can't listen to themselves. They didn't develop independence. They just lived in chaos. And now there is no boss. There is no Rav and there is no Talmud. There is no master and there is no servant. Now they can't say no to themselves. That's very painful and very sad. So what is it that we want from our children? We want them to know we're here to serve someone else's need, not our own. When we come on Rosh Hashanah and we ask God to give us a year, a good year and a sweet year, somebody pointed out, Jews are so particular. We need a Shana, Teva, Umesuka. So first of all, give me a year. I want another year of life. Not just a regular year of life. I want a good year of life. And not just good. It has to be sweet also. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have complaints. So we want a good year that is also sweet. We come on Rosh Hashanah and we make all these demands and requests and we plead and we... It's not about us. It's not about us. Tshuva means, I think I spent some time last year just on myself and I wasn't thinking about you, about Hashem. This year, please, don't let me do that again. The, the Sefer HaChayim means the wisdom of life. What is a Sefer? It's not a checklist. It's a book of wisdom. I don't want to just be on the list of people who survive Rosh Hashanah. It's not, it's not a bulletin board and your name gets put up with it, you know, determine whether you're going to prosper or not, whether you're going to live or not. No. We want the book of life. Because last year we didn't treat life properly. Life means pursuing the purpose for which we exist. So we hope and we pray that this coming year will be a much more productive year. We will pursue the purpose for which we live more consistently, more deeply, more sincerely than we did last year. Okay, Rabbi Friedman, that what that was a, an opening that I think that covered almost everything. That was very deep, very profound. And now let's get into it. Now let's get into it with that opening. Okay, so everybody is here. Um, if it's Chos Rav having uh, Ramanas here with us tonight, let's let's hop around and let's ask him questions. We're going to start with a poll. Everybody answer to the best of your ability, and uh, we're going to take it from there. Okay, two poll question. What is your primary motive, motivating factor behind your emotional connection relationship with your parents? So somebody asking, what's your connection with your parents? Four options, love and emotional bond, money relationship, since they helped me out so much, that's my relationship with them. Number three, out of respect, the Torah says, keep that vein, so that's why I respect them. Or option number four, all the years of support and guidance. Answer what your, your personal connection is with your parents. It could be any of them, it's not right or wrong. Second question, what is your perspective on fostering a lasting connection with your children as they grow older? Number one, open communication with, with them all the years. Number two, buy them whatever they want and make them feel like you take care of them. Number three, respecting their independence, allowing them to make choices while providing support. Support, I should say support. Option four, adapting to the changing dynamics of their life, showing interest in their, in their, in their interests and providing, I wish I could read the rest, basically in providing them like, you know, chizik for what they're choosing. So those are the two questions. Everybody answer the best of your ability. And uh, let's jump into the live questions. Okay, five seconds.
Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Second, one second, one second. A lot of people are voting slow. Okay, let's share the poll with everybody. Okay, the first question. What is your primary motiv motivating factor behind your emotional connection and relationship with your parents? 43% of the people say love and emotional bond. Only 2% of the people say it's money relationships since they helped me out so much. 35% say out of respect with the terrorist says so. And 20% say all the years of supporting guidance. Hermanos, you see most people are saying it's the love and the emotional bonds. Just interesting. Number two, what is your perspective on fostering a lasting connection with your children as they grow older? 26% say open communication with them all the years. Only one one only one percent say buy them whatever they want to make them feel taken care of. Twenty three percent say respecting their independence, allowing them to make choices while pro providing support. And the winning answer: forty nine percent of people say adapting to the changing dynamics, showing interest in their interest, and providing them support for that whatever they do. So those are the two things. Ramana, you want to comment on anything before we go to questions? Well, it's not surprising that love and emotional bond would be the most popular because we all wish that that were the case. And maybe maybe it is the most common love and emotional bond because even the pain that parents cause is an emotional bond. So if we have that attitude or that approach, we went through some tough, you know, Sometimes we agreed, sometimes I love what you do, sometimes I hated what you do, but all of that is part of a relationship. So parents should not regret some of the mistakes they made if it was done in the process of parenting. It certainly wasn't an intentional hurt. And if you're in the process of parenting, you don't regret even the things you did wrong. Because what do you think? You're a perfect, in a perfect specimen and can never make a mistake. You have to paddle. You have to keep stroking. As parents, you got to keep parenting. And sometimes you make a miss move or a miss. Fine. It's all part of parenting. And that's how we have to look at our parents' mistakes. They were parenting. And they should never regret that. And we should never object to their parenting because not parenting is the worst thing. So the emotional bond is not only the love. It's also the disappointments and the hurts and the hard feelings. It's all part of the emotional bond. Let's go to some live questions. Okay, you're on. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. So I have a, as a parenting question here, um, I'm raising my children myself and I have a son who's just about 20. Um, he, you know, my household is religious. He is not. And he's with a non-Jewish girl and has decided that this seems to be the one he's talking about moving in with her has no doesn't seem to have any qualms or issues with the fact that she's not jewish and i just wanted to know you know um how, how do you suggest to healing to handle this and you know I, I try to be supportive of my children all the time and i it's interesting this poll being uh you know emotional support um but this is really this is difficult and i i'm not sure what the best way to, you know, to deal with this is, and I'm glad to know what you have to say. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's almost superhuman. But you have to think about this. Why do we get married? Why marriage? Why is it necessary? So, oh, because I like her very much. 
So you can like her without marrying her. What's marriage? What do you need marriage for? In fact, most people today don't bother getting married. The only reason to get married really is because it's God's way of living. Not necessary for a human condition. It's a godly way. You don't want to do it God's way. Do it your way. But why get married? So that's that's one message that you want to try to get across. I don't know that there is a marriage. I think it just nowadays, like you're saying, just living together. Right. So you want to let him know you're not objecting to his loving her. You just don't think it's a good idea for them to marry. And number two, what kind of girl is she? Are you interested? Are you curious? Would you like to know your son's taste in girls? <laughs> That's what you should be talking about to him right now. What kind of girl is she? What is she good at? What is she not good at? Don't just say, That's it, I'm marrying her. So in other words, take an interest in what is right now his life. Otherwise, you become the outsider, and as an outsider, you don't get to have an opinion. So stay on the inside with him, take an interest in her, to know what she's like and what he likes and what, what, what attracts him, what, make him think, make him describe and put into words what is going on. And marriage? No, don't marry. You don't have to marry unless you want to do what God says. But if you're not going to do what God says, then, then don't marry. It's okay. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good balance of you're not giving in to anything that you're not allowed to do, but you are interested in your son. You might just win him back. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to another live question. Just one second. Okay, you're on. Hi, okay. Um, so I'm wondering about when it's two parents um, raising children and each have their own personality style and different way of um, connecting with the children and different like method of parenting. So I know some people say like you have to be on the same page. But I was wondering, like, if you're both healthy, you're both forming a healthy connection, you're just going about a different path. Is it okay for our children to see, like, mommy is this way and daddy is this way? So, uh, for example, um, I have a baby. So let's say when it came to um, one of us was more like, just give the baby whatever they want. They're a baby, like, spoil them, hold them, rock them, however long they need. And the other one is like, no, but it, they can't, like get used to it and you should like sometimes let them cry so just a silly example but the idea is can you have in a long run different approaches where you just say i trust you to do your approach and you trust me for me to do my approach yeah you should not be saying the same thing mm -hmm. yeah i'm not talking about taylor and mitzvahs you have to disagree on whether you eat rice on pesach but in terms of, of personality, in terms of style, you know, uh, be a little more strict, a little more lenient, a little more verbal, a little less verbal. Don't be the same. You're not the same. There's a mother and a father. And if they're the same, then you end up with either two mothers or two fathers. So the father should be different, should sound different, should speak different than the mother. And the mother should be different from the father. So the real question is, whatever, whatever method you're using, is it working? A father can be a little more strict than the mother, but check to see if it's working. If it's not hurting the child, if it's not turning him off, because if it's not working, then there's nothing to talk about. 
So the differences are not what worries the child. It's it's the feeling that they're not they're not being treated properly. Now, of course, arguing in front of the kid is is terrible. Because that means that you don't have respect for each other, and a child can't handle that. But having different tone of voice, having a different expectation, that's fine. I mean, that's not a, that has to be. Just check to make sure that both methods, whatever it is you're using, whatever it is your husband is using, that it's actually working for you that the child is thriving from it. A child who runs away when his father walks in the door, this is not working. So don't argue about, about style, look at success. Thank you, that answers it. Here's a, another interesting question. Um, this lady writes, my husband and I have been married for 16 years. My husband is not available as he's an alcoholic, uh, workaholic, sorry. As a mom and a children, give them, give the children what I can. But what happens with the father-child side that they so desperately need and must have? She has four boys, and she's giving them whatever she can, but they're missing their father. What could she do to fill in? Oh, don't try to fill in. Just tell the children that your father is a good father. He's really concerned for you. He supports you. He takes care of you. He's not the type that does a lot of uh, stuff at home. He's not the type that... Uh, plays with children. There are many such parents, such fathers, and, and it's fine. Don't let it become a crisis in the child's thinking. Like he doesn't have a father. Of course he has a father. Now, if the father is cold, that's a different thing. If the father ignores the kid when he's home, that's that's hurtful, but if the father is the the, the you know the strong silent type, that's okay. And you got to tell your child, your father is that kind of father. There are different kinds of fathers, but if you start to worry about it and if you start to get upset, then it's you and the kids against your against your husband, and then it's. There's no shalom bias. What could she do? Um, let's say it's somebody that's struggling with shalom bias. And um, she has to work on, again, it's not easy. It's not easy, but don't let the kids know that you're struggling with your husband. Just make sure they know that they have a father. They're not fatherless. That's the most painful thing. You know, if you can, you can admit my father is not good at fixing uh, broken bicycles. Okay. But he's a father. When the kid gets the impression that he's not a father and that uh, the child feels like an orphan, that, that's, that you can prevent. But he's not around. But well, because he's busy, it doesn't mean he's not a father. You know, you have to reassure the child that there are different styles of fathering. Some fathers are very involved, hands-on. Some fathers are not. But if you start complaining that you're unhappy with him, with the husband, well, that's, that's the end. That's like no father at all, and that's, that's not... Not livable. <clears throat> you know, just on this on the topic, 
There are people who think about Sholem Bayis and worry about Sholem Bayis and want Sholem Bayis, but they're focused only on the Sholem, not on the Bayis. Some people want Sholem Bayis without a Bayis. They just want Sholem. That doesn't work. First, make sure you have a bias. You have a functional relationship. Then you can move up to the more ambitious plan of having a sholem bias. But if you don't, if you don't function like a family, sholem is not your problem. Problem is you don't have a bias. If children start to misbehave and, and become chutzpahdik, you, you got to do something. You can't accept it as an alternative lifestyle. It's not a bias. You know the Fiddler on the Roof song, a tradition? The mama is a mama. The papa is a papa. The daughter is a daughter, the son is a son. Are they getting along fabulously? Maybe not. But there's a mama, there's a papa, there's a daughter, there's a son. There's a bias. And this bias needs a little oil to keep it running smoothly. But if the child has taken on the role of the parent, and the father is just not involved at all, and the mother has become the policeman. This is not a bias. Never mind Sholem bias. It's not a bias. I once recommended to a woman, she was raising her daughter alone, and the daughter talked to her with such chutzpah, with such... She rolled her eyes when her mother cried. I said, okay, hold it, stop right there. You're trying to uh, reach a mutually agreeable decision. Skip it. Try to become family again. I said, why don't, why don't you make believe you're the mother and the daughter should make believe she's the daughter and play house? You're not even playing house. If a daughter can roll her eyes at her mother, she's not a daughter, the mother's not a mother, and you're worried about agreeing on something? So, there are the simple rules of a house, the functions of a house. Whether you agree on everything, whether you're... you're, you're wheels are turning smoothly that's a second layer the first layer is do you have wheels is this a workable situation so make sure the mother is a mother and the father is a father to your children there's nothing more powerful than a mother demanding respect for the father not for herself. And there's nothing more powerful than a father who demands respect for the mother. That's how the children learn. That's what gives parents authority. Today's parents hardly have any authority at all. Because let's let's jump on to the next live question. We have so many lives. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, you're on. Hi. Um, okay, first I just want to say that I'm sure there are very many good therapists out there, but I hear from friends who have sent a child, like an older child, a teen, a young adult for therapy, or the child said they want to go for therapy, and then the child becomes very egocentric and self-centered. The therapists are teaching them that they have to do basically whatever makes them happy. What can be done once that happens? And the child now has a different 
you know, mindset that their goal in life is to do whatever makes them happy. Based on what the therapist tells them. Yeah. I think you have to be very blunt and say that therapist is completely wrong and, and is making more problems than, the, than, than they're solving. This whole Mishigas with self approval, self acceptance, self validation, self love, high self image, it's a disease. It's mamish a disease. The Torah says that Avas Atzma is the beginning of all evil. And they say it's the solution to all problems. They're very wrong, dangerously wrong. And I think if you speak to children about it, they will agree with you. Me, me, me. Can't be right. Can't be right. Even children will understand it. The only issue, um, they like what the therapist is telling them. They're, they're no more like they now have a mind of their own. Like the therapist gave them a heter. This is what that's good for them. Like you have to do what makes you happy. Forget about what your parents are telling you. Forget about this. And now they like what the therapists are telling them better than what their parents are telling them. I know they like it. It's like they like chocolate. But can you convince your child that eating too much chocolate is not good? Not always. Well, let's assume an intelligent child, if you explain it to them, will agree with you. And they'll laugh at themselves for their obsession with chocolate. Kids, kids are not... Kids are not stupid. They're just irresponsible. <laughs> but if you explain something to them, they do understand it. So if you make a joke about it, you know, the me, 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 it's a monster, like a cookie monster. They'll understand it. They really do. I think, I think many people are confused when they hear this concept because like you're saying the world out there is teaching it and the way i see it is that there are many people walking around with no with like doormats like they don't have any sense of self and what they need is to feel a little bit of knowing who am i not that it has to intervene with kibidav but it, it builds them. Now, it does go wrong many times. But the question is, what they're teaching out there, are we just putting everything on the side with that, whether it's uh, just being self-aware, you know, emotional? How do we um, work on this together? Well, if, if it's a teenager or older, the, the, the therapist is right in saying, do what you want to do. Correct. You're not a slave to your parents. They don't own you. And you don't have to do everything they say. Because some parents give very bad advice. So yeah, you are an independent person. You have your own will, your own opinion, your own needs. Doesn't mean that everything you want is right. And just because you want it, you should do it. That's not freedom. It's easier to understand. <laughs> that, that's that's addiction. Yeah. All right, Friedman, let's go to the next one. Okay, you're on. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Um, so I have a couple questions. Firstly, I really liked uh, somebody asked a question before about having different parenting styles than her husband. Um, so definitely, um, I I see the value in having different styles and then also um, most importantly, respecting that you're both the parents and showing peace in front of them. But what if, like you're saying, the main thing is to check, is it working? So what if it doesn't look like it's working? Um, so for example, my daughter, um, she seems to like a lot of personal space and my husband's very loving, very affectionate. And he very often comes up close to her, gives her hugs and kisses. And usually when she's like kind of in the middle of something and she always just gets really, really mad and she says, no, stop. And she yells at him and runs away. And he just like kind of runs after her, tries to hug her. Um, and it's just very, 
like triggering and worrisome and I don't really know how to handle it without causing um you know with that with how do I also respect my husband and also show her like this is your father he means well and it's good and what do you say to your husband so if I am good enough about not reacting in front of her um usually I I try not to tell him anything because I realize it's just my own thing that's in the way and I try to just value where he's coming from and realize that it's it's very innocent and it's a lot of love and it's very beautiful but sometimes I do tell him like you know I'm wondering what you think you know it seems to me that she she likes her independence she likes to be just you know she's in the middle of something she likes to just have her thought process going and he's just like yeah but she's just too adorable I can't I can't help myself I can't help myself and then I'm like okay but you're the parent like it's not a you don't want to you don't want to hear those words from your husband i'm um, like it's not about you you're raising her I help myself doesn't sound very encouraging but i think you have to keep at this at the uh the topic your affection is beautiful but not if somebody doesn't want it there are five love languages and she wants a different language so why not give her the love she wants? That way she'll actually like you. Yeah, that's exactly what I tell him. Keep reminding him. It's not disrespectful, like as a wife to... Not at all. Hmm. Not at all disrespectful. I mean, you, of course you could be disrespectful if you intend to be. But if you're simply pointing something out that is real and true and obvious mm. it's not like you can only say it once or twice he, he might not be aware of the five love languages and um if he does it's just to realize what he's doing for her or is doing it for himself yeah that's what i told him i think he is doing it for himself um and i and I told him that I, I, you know, also sometimes I feel like I just want to do things that are for myself, but I'm like, I'm her parents, not about me. I, I need to do what is going to help her in her life. And it's, it scares me a lot of times. Like just, you know, I feel like it, it's like, you know, I don't want to go there, but I like almost, you know, makes me feel like it's giving her the message that like, you know, if an adult just wants to give her affection because it feels good, then just go for it. And, and that really scares me a lot. So is he more affectionate than you? He is. Um, sometimes with me too. Like he's just, he's very, very affectionate. And also will say sometimes like, oh, I can't help myself. And I'm like, okay, it's really beautiful, but it's not about you. It's about affection is about the person you're giving affection to. But, but I think maybe focus on the, um, on the loss, on the consequence. <sighs> Well, he means well, and he loves doing what he's doing, but he's going to end up with a with a daughter who doesn't like him. Nobody she already does. doesn't. Like, she'll tell me, I don't like Ava. So he always hugs me, and I don't like Dan. She's two. Wow. Wow. She just turned two, and she, she will turn to me, and she'll be like, Mama, I don't like Ava. He hugs and kisses me too much, and I want to play. I just got finished saying that children are precocious these days. I didn't think it was at two. Yeah, she's scarily intelligent. Wow. Hmm. He's extremely articulate, and she and she'll tell him that. Like, she'll tell him in his face, "Stop! I don't like. I don't. Don't touch me. Don't touch my body and move." Like. Wow. So you got to keep reminding your husband you're losing your daughter. You're creating an enemy out of her. Yeah, and when I leave the room, like, she freaks out. She's like, no, I don't want to be with Abba. Even though other times she loves to be with him, like, she really loves him, but she's scared he's going to just hug her, and she hates it. And I, I hardly hug her because she just doesn't like it. So I play with her, and, like, she just doesn't like hugs. Yeah. She's very non sexual so, since she was a newborn. So scare your husband and with the thought that his daughter is going to hate him. Okay, I was just always afraid that that was like not receiving as a wife, like not being the cabo and 
No, first of all, you're you're protecting your daughter. And and when it comes to that, you can be ferocious. Okay. <laughs> like a okay. lot of this. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, for his own sake, what, what is he going to do if his daughter hates him? Yeah. Yeah, that... Laura Freeman, let's jump into the next question, if that's okay, okay? Somebody is basically writing over here, I'm conscious of the fact that I was abusive during my child, my children's upbringing. I did a really bad job. What steps can I take now that they are married and we have a very distant relationship? Is there still any chance to mend things after the fact? Yeah. Take a real interest in everything about their lives. Don't try to make up or change anything. Whatever their lives are, take a real interest. People, people like attention, especially from their own parents. So you know, don't, don't talk about the mistakes and don't try to correct them. Just show a real interest and a real pride in how they grew up. Are you proud? Could be they grew up very well without much help from you. But you can take credit for that too. You must have done something right. So don't focus on what was wrong, focus on what is right. And if there was nothing right in the past, then what's right in the present? And what's right is you take an interest. Don't try to fix, don't try to change, don't try to control, just take an interest. Be excited about the things they're excited about. Does it happen many times that the parents try to be involved and it pushes them further away. Yeah, trying to be involved could end up feeling like you're trying to control or influence. You don't want to do that. You just want to take pleasure in your children's lives. As much as much of the information they give you. As little. <laughs> They're probably going to give you little to go on, but whatever little you have, get excited, tell them they're thrilled for them, it's so nice, and, and no attempt at controlling or influencing. Very good. Here's another interesting question. Um, a few years ago, I went through a divorce, and since then, my ex has constantly portrayed me in a negative light to our children, suggesting that I am indifferent, do not invest enough time with them. The reality is that I have, I have them only every other weekend, and I'm generally committed to making the most of that time. Despite my efforts, I'm finding it increasingly challenging to forge connection with my kids. It seems that the harder I try, the more distant they become. Heartbreakingly, I haven't had the opportunity to see my children for three years. I'm not sure how that worked. How can I navigate this situation, work towards rebuilding a meaningful relationship with them? She hasn't seen them in three years? It sounds like they have divorced more than three years. But it's been, it's been a while she hasn't seen them, or she or he didn't have seen them. Hmm. She may have to wait until the kids are a little older because right now they're simply protecting the father. They've taken his side and they're protecting him. So nothing she says is going to get through to them. They are very loyal to their father. Maybe as they get older and they become a little curious about their mother, and they're brave enough to do something without their father's approval, 
They'll come looking for you, and then you'll be able to set them straight. But right now, I, if, if, if he can keep them away from you for three years, he's got way too much power. What if there is some relationship every few weeks and they feel distant because of the way the other talks about them? So the best thing you can do is keep reminding the kids that when a husband and wife get divorced, they shouldn't talk badly about each other. And don't talk badly about him. In other words, take the high road, do the right thing, and they'll realize eventually that the father is wrong in being so critical or, or nasty. But, but don't say he's wrong. Just say parents who get divorced don't badmouth each other. And that's why you're never going to say anything negative about their father. Let them let them draw their own conclusion. You know, we really are, are at the mercy of our children and we have to believe that they're intelligent. And that if you just do the right thing, they will notice. And if he's doing the wrong thing, they will notice that too. The only, it's the only way to live is with confidence in the children. That they have enough decency, you gave them enough of a, of a chinuch to know right from wrong, and they will understand. If we're, if we're convinced that our children are, are simply not intelligent, then there's nothing to talk about. That there's no one to talk to. Trust your children. It may take a while, but they will come around. Hermanus, let's jump onto this interesting question, okay? Maintaining a relationship with my parents has become increasingly detrimental to my well-being. Their lack of healthy boundaries and, cons and consistent infer interference with my relationship with my spouse and siblings lead to ongoing fights and conflicts. Their strong and unsolicited opinions add further strain. As I work through my own healing, their actions often sabotage my, pro my progress. It's apparent that they hold my therapist responsible for the changes I'm making, and their anger towards this is, you know, you know, I don't know the right word they're writing, but basically it could make sense. However, it's important to acknowledge that the pattern of anger and frustration penetrates my decision to seek help. So basically, like, how do I deal with my parents that are really not healthy for me? And as I'm going to the therapist and the therapist is guiding me to have my own boundaries as an adult, um, while they, they're feeling more and more disconnected for me. So what we said before, um, the only, the only way to make peace with parents, and that is what you want to do, and the therapist should help you with that, not, not create further distance. In other words, the therapist should help you be more accepting of them as they are, rather than warning you to avoid them and to maintain your own independence. You don't need that. You need the ability to accept them as they are. That's really what you want to do. Of course, you want them to accept you as you are, but that's up to them. There's nothing you can do about that. So the first step in accepting them as they are is entitle them. Don't judge them. Don't keep thinking, oh, they did this wrong. They're doing this wrong. Right, Manus, I'm going to pause you for a second, okay? Go ahead. Let's go to the next live question. It ties into it. Okay, you're on. Um, what is uh, the the adult child obligation for kibbutz Ava M if the parent is 
uh, deceiving, manipulative, looking how to use you, um, favoring another child. Um, you, you, if you can go there and spend the whole day helping them and they'll say, you don't have time for me. What do you, how do you, how do you keep your, what is the obligation? The obligation is to be very respectful. How to not to correct them when they are, say things that aren't true? Like, have, what specifically, how do you respect a parent like that? If you correct them, you do it respectfully. Not talking down to them, not, not being condemning, certainly not being threatening. You speak respectfully. And you just tell the truth the way it is. The way you would with someone who's not your father or your mother, you would be respectful. But the thing is, I mean, there is some truth to the statement that you are hurt only to the degree that you allow yourself to be hurt. So the question is not why they behave the way they behave. The question is, why does it devastate you? After, you know, it's not the first time, it's not the second time, you should be immune to it already by now. You know what they are, you know what they think, you know how they talk. Don't get shocked every time again and again and again. Just realize your parents are good at some things and they're really not good at other things. And they're not going to be. So don't expect them to suddenly change their mind. They have their favorite child. That's the way it's going to be. Does that mean you're not their child? You are their child. So really the therapists in, in, in these issues, they, they just create more distance and more intolerance. And when you're trying to create more tolerance, or that's what you need, how are you more tolerant? If you give them the, the entitlement, yeah, you, you're entitled to be a little crazy, you're entitled to be a little off, you worked very hard, you had your own problems, you're entitled. You don't have to be perfect for me. that you, you'll, you'll, you'll stop feeling so much pain. You'll stop being hurt to the degree that you are. You know, the most, the most impressive thing, a child whose parent is really not all there and their behavior could be actually embarrassing. So the immature child will never invite his friends to his house because he doesn't want his friends to know that his mother is weird. A mature child will say, hey, come over to my house. I'll introduce you to my mother. Uh, don't talk to her. She's weird, but she's my mom. If you can be comfortable with your mother's issues, if you can be comfortable with your mother's failings, or even even insanity, you're fine. What age? What age would you think a child can do that? If you're already married, for sure. I think many good good therapists help the person deal with it, like you're saying. They're holding their hands and giving them the concepts that you're discussing. Hopefully, hopefully, or they're saying, "Don't let your mother affect you." Don't talk to her. Don't don't let her into the house. But let's take an example that we mentioned before. If you went to help your mother a full day, you would be here for many hours. And at the end of the day, she tells you, you never have time for me. And you never come over. And she give, gives you that guilt, guilt trip. How, how do you take that? Yeah. Uh, by the same token, how do you take it when you do everything for your child? And your child says, you never give me anything. <laughs> what do you do? You smile and you say, well, sometimes I give you something. So that's, that's a hard to 
Yeah, it depends, it depends on how, how threatened you feel. But you need you don't need to feel so threatened. You've established yourself, you've done well, you've got your own life, your mother gave you life to be able to achieve what you achieved. So thank her for what she did and the rest. To have that healthy balance, many people need somebody to guide them because they feel guilty. Let's say they were there, they were only there for four hours. They could have been there five. They were only there for one day. They could have been there two. And they walk away feeling guilty. Well, they walk away feeling hurt because they're still expecting their mother's approval. And the mother just won't approve no matter what they do. So if they're there for four hours, the mother says, why not five? Okay, you know your mother has this problem. Stop taking it personally. It's her problem. So hopefully the therapist could hold their hands. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's very true that people are so much stronger than they think they are. Like this woman who says to me, I can't take it. I cannot take it anymore. I can't. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I, said, I know you told me this 10 years ago. <laughs> And you kept at it for another 10 years? What do you mean you can't? You're much stronger than you're admitting. We handle things a lot better than we think we're handling it. So give yourself a little credit. Your mother hurts you. She can't devastate you. She can't cripple you for the rest of the day with her criticism or with her lack of judgment or whatever. Especially since you're already used to it. You know it's going to happen. It could be a very good comedy routine. <laughs> okay, right, everyone, let's go to the next live question. Okay, you're on. Yeah, hi. Um, I've been in intense therapy for like the past like two years, and I made a lot of progress. Um, I've been dealing with like really low self-esteem and things like that. Um, and like the one thing that's helped me is like learning how to like, you know, love myself and like accept the way I am and like all that type of thing. Um, I heard you mention earlier that like that's all wrong and all things like that. Um, I'm just curious how that could be if like I find that that's what helped me like to become a normal like human in society and be able to be loving and caring to other people. If it works, I will not argue with it. I can't argue with success. But the objective, the long-term goal, is not to love yourself. The long-term is to accomplish enough so that you don't need to love yourself. You don't hate yourself. You don't love yourself. You're no longer an issue. That would be perfect. So going from hating yourself to loving yourself is a slight improvement. The real improvement is it's not about me. So whatever I am is fine. Do I have a, self, a high self-image or a low self-image? I don't care. <laughs> What's the difference? That would be perfect. You can only do that if you're not critical on yourself. Huh? You could only do that if you're not walking around being critical about yourself. Yeah, so being critical of yourself and being in love with yourself are really two sides of the same coin. Because it's still just self. When you can dismiss yourself and not pay attention, that's, that's the best. You're perfectly okay, balanced. You. Okay, Reverend Friedman, there's another live question here. Unmute. Just waiting for them to unmute. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, yes. I have a friend that's had some problems and she told me that she doesn't talk to her mother for the last 10 years. I told her, we're trying in every which, you know, every which way to help her. And all of a sudden I felt that, you know, I think that it's time to make up with your mother. 
after not talking to her for 10 years. She had babies, nothing, no shaykhs. So she thought it was maybe a good idea. She would try. She would try. You know, so that can bring a bracha in her life. She was with Baruch Hashem, she had Shalom Bayez, she had children. It was an, another issue. And she discussed it with her therapist. And she told me to call her therapist. And I actually called a therapist. And I'm blown away what the therapist told me. The therapist told me, no, it's not a good idea. It's not a good time now. It's not the best time. I'm working with her for a couple of years. And, and I argued with the therapist. I don't care what you're saying, but let her have minimal shaykhs with the mother. Minimal. Good Shabbos. I get yantiv. I get you. I know what I'm doing, he tells me. Rabbanim support me. And that's it. She does not have to talk to her mother. And I'm blown away. I told him the Baal Shem Tov would say this. And the Tanya says this. Where do you have the guts to say this? And that was it. So your question is, should you pay the therapist? <laughs> um, I, I want to bring this awareness. And I want to say, like, what do I go back to the lady? And what do I tell her? I mean, I told her to drop that therapist. But... What do I do, Viter? You say that on Yom Kippur or out of Yom Kippur, it's a really big mitzvah to um, wish your mother a good year. You're not talking about a relationship. You're not talking about changing the relationship. But wishing your mother a ksila v'chasim teva very important. <laughs> if she can't handle it, the therapist might say she can't handle it. I don't, I don't, you think she's going to ask the therapist whether she can say a good year to, his, to her mother? No, the therapist might be right that she's not ready to start a relationship. That may be true. So don't call it a relationship. Don't call it making up and, and becoming good friends. Just, you know, it's Yom Kippur. So children have at least a chiv once a year, at least try to once a year, um, just be once a year she should do? I don't know if you call it a chiv. It's a mental thing. Just because her mother is not a mensch doesn't mean she can't be. Right. So just blame it on Yom Kippur. Mm-hmm. And for people that don't have shaykhs to parents, what are ways to, you know, to tell them to get back to it? Even though your parents are not a mensch, just be menschlich and, and do minimal of just the, uh, get you before you tell or don't what, are, what, what are small steps, small steps for people to come and take? Uh, on a birthday, on an anniversary, you say something positive, you say something I'm really grateful for something you did or said. Don't call it a relationship. And don't try to change the relationship. Just do things that a daughter would do if everything were normal. Even though nothing is normal. It would be at least believable. But if the daughter tries to act like, you know, we're going to be friends again, it's not believable. So don't, don't, don't let it get too ambitious. You're not going to become best friends. But a daughter wishes her mother a good year or a happy birthday or an anniversary or regards from an anical. Okay, Rabbi Friedman, let's go to the next live question. You're on. Hi. So there's a lot, a lot that I want to ch be challenging on. I'm going to, um, and there's a lot that I hear that is really helpful, um, being that I am, I've gone through a lot of abuse in my childhood, and I'm wondering how you know, from, either from the quote that you share about, I mean, there's 
some, like a quote that already, if you can't raise your children, you can't raise your children if you're still trying to raise yourselves, right? There is this piece of, you know, for myself, you know, if I had a choice to become a parent or just, yeah, I'm a parent and I do all that it takes to be the best parent, but there's a lot of, you know, very strong feelings to my parents, how they raised me. It was very abusive and how can you forgive and have that relationship or make slow steps? Mm. Well, first of all, assess the damage. Whatever, whatever abuse you put up with, how much damage did it cause? A lot, a lot. Be more specific with yourself. Don't, you know, don't tell me, but you know, spell it out. What? You can't function. You couldn't get married. Nobody wanted to marry you. You didn't have children. You couldn't have children. Children don't like you. Don't what? What? Should How I be bad speaking? is the damage? That's what is it called? Is that okay, so after I ask myself this question, how bad is the damage? You you will be surprised that you are doing quite well. So although your parents were very abusive, your life has not suffered much from it. It's How so? But my suffering is every day. It's my maybe I'm choosing not to suffer because I'm healing and I'm, you know, working towards a productive life and raising healthy children. But it's maybe. there's a lot of pain. Yeah, but the pain has not stopped you from having a life. So you're not. Because I work. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is, you, you, you made a life for yourself. So they didn't cripple you. They just left you with some really bad memories. Mm. But your, mm. your life is good. I wish. So reassess that, reassess that. The people around you, your friends, think that you have a nebuch life or a good life? Um, I'm a, why it matters what I see. I don't know what no. they. No, no, because the pain doesn't let you see clearly. Ask people who are not subjective what they see. Get an objective opinion. You'll be surprised. <laughs> You're, you're doing much better than you give yourself credit. So though I'm doing much better than I'm giving myself credit, I'm still left with a lot of deep pain. Yes, but not, so, crippled, not failed. You're but not I've failed. been crippled for a very long time. Emotionally, maybe? Emotionally, yeah. Mentally yeah. and physically, where how it affected me. But not functionally. So, you know, the problem is that we get a very unbalanced view of ourselves. The pain could be very, very real. I'm not questioning that at all. Mm -hmm. But so is your success. So don't paint a picture that's all bad when it's only half bad. Balance it. Balance. Right, but we're very, I find that I'm very consumed by the grief and the sadness of... You're obviously not very consumed because then you wouldn't have been able to make a life. I gotta tell you this story. I was speaking to a group of women and I said something about every woman eventually becomes like her mother. And that's a good thing. Well, this one woman exploded. She jumped out of her seat and she said, well, maybe your mother, but my mother. And she goes through a whole list of, she was, she was controlling and she was destructive and she ruined her marriage and my marriage and my sister's marriage. She said, what would you say to that? I said, oh, in that case, take her out in the back and shoot her. 
She said, no, I'm serious. I said, so am I. Take her out in the backyard and shoot her. She needs killing. So she says, come on, she wasn't that bad. I said, oh. <laughs> you want to describe her again and describe what you be? Because what you described is a monster that needs to be killed. And then I said to her, how did I know that your description of your mother was not true? Because look at you. You're a human being. You're a put together human being. If your mother was as bad as you say, you would be even worse because you're the daughter of such a mother. The product of such a mother. So the fact, yeah. okay. the fact that you maintain your own, you have your own dignity, you, you have your own opinion, you obviously your mother was not the monster you think she was. So, so if I was able to, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. If I was able to pull myself out of it and I got the treatment and I work hard every day, but watching siblings that did not get that. So I have proof, you know, what type of, you know, abuse went on. Oh, there's no question there was abuse. Right. So there's the, my, my question is really like, how can I lessen the grief and the, the like the deep um, pain of the past? Balance the picture. You're, you're making it sound like all you had was misery. And if all I had was misery, how can I get rid of like the pain that I have? It can't be that all you had was misery because you're not a miserable person. Because I work on myself. I work hard. Where did that strength come from? From not from my mother, from my <laughs> therapist. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if your mother was very determined also in all the wrong ways. So you you inherited her determination, but you're using it in a more constructive way. Okay. With this with this I I'll, I'll yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. Really, you, you have to give yourself a little more credit. Okay. You're, you're an impressive human being, even though your mother wasn't. And that's something. Okay, and I have one more question um, about loving ourselves. Doesn't it say like, love yourself so we can yeah, yeah, yeah. love I others? I love, I love that interpretation. Okay. It says, love others like you love yourself. Well, what if I don't love myself? Mm -hmm. So obviously the Torah is making a big assumption. The Torah is assuming you love yourself a lot and that's how you should love everybody else. Is the Torah wrong? You don't love yourself? Well, then the Torah is not talking to you. The Torah is talking to somebody who loves themselves a lot and is saying, can you share a little of that self-love with others or is it all for you? Mm. But it doesn't say love yourself. It's assuming that you love yourself. Mm. Mm -hmm. you to share it okay don't keep uh, it to yourself and by the way mm -hmm. the reason we hurt over our own failures or or the uh, the non-acceptance of our parents is because we love ourselves the fact that you have a lot of pain doesn't mean you don't love yourself I mean, your neighbor may have had the same mother. Doesn't hurt you. What hurts is that it happened to you and you love yourself. I mean, you, you don't love yourself romantically. <laughs> that you wrote, you write poems to yourself. But you love yourself because everything you experience and everything that happens to you, you take seriously. That's self-love. Mm -hmm. So the more the pain, the more the love. The more the love, the more the pain. Okay. You definitely gave me a lot to think about. Yeah. There, there was a sign I saw in a store. 
you know these these thought signs that you hang in your house mm-hmm. what are they called uh, affirmations mm-hmm. anyway so this one sign said every day do something that you really enjoy i think that's brilliant the only problem is that everyone is always doing what they enjoy <laughs> Nobody needs to be told to do something you enjoy. You eat ice cream, you have a piece of chocolate, you uh, you put on your favorite slippers. I mean, come on, we're always doing what we enjoy. No one needs to tell us. The question is, can you also make someone else enjoy? Mm. So, v'ahavta levecha kamecha means share some of your self-love. Mm-hmm. You don't have any, no such thing. You wouldn't wake up in the morning if you didn't love yourself. I guess if you don't have any, then you still need someone to hold that for you. You can't not have any. You can't. <sighs> it can be sour. You know what I mean? It can be like. There could be times where you don't have any. Any self love? Yeah. There well, could be then, times. Then you wouldn't care. I wouldn't, and I know that I wouldn't because I didn't. You, there was a time I've been there. In times where I didn't care. You so weren't, you weren't in pain. I wa- If I wasn't, I, I'm assuming I was. Of some sort of pain that I didn't care. So yeah. You know, it's like people who cut themselves. Mm, similar. Well, is that because they love themselves or they hate themselves? They hate themselves. Not Don't they? they? No. Nope. Okay, so challenge me on that. They love themselves and they want to feel alive, so they cut themselves. Even a person who is suicidal loves himself. That's why he won't tolerate this pain. It's self, isn't it self-defense? So the question is, is it a healthy love or a negative kind of love or angry love? But it's love. So the whole issue Do I love myself? Don't I love myself? It's not important. It really isn't. The question is, what can you do with your life that is productive and helpful and holy and godly? With love, without love, what's the difference? You're not here to love yourself. Just like you weren't given the ability to speak so that you can talk to yourself. You're given the ability to speak so you can speak to others. And you weren't given money so that you can keep it under your mattress. You were given money to spend it, invest it, give it. Same is true with love. You're given love so that you can give it away, not keep it. So if you're doing it, you're taking care of your kids, you're raising a family, you're awesome. You're absolutely awesome. Okay, thanks for the affirmation. But I mean it. Yeah, I'll try to sit with it. Okay. Thank you. Thank there, you so much. For everyone, one last one, and then we're going to go to closing. Sorry for keeping you so late, but it's so deep tonight. They're shaking Himalayan over here. Okay, last question. You're on. Hello? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. Hi, Rabbi. Thank you for so much. Okay, uh, I have a 25-year-old daughter that just graduated Columbia University, of all things. And uh, she's trying uh, very hard and basically su- succeeding, trying to embrace this hard, competitive, often cutthroat professional world and just the world outside in general. And I'm trying to keep... Uh, She's living on her own. We communicate uh, on phone rarely through text messages, basically. Uh, And I'm trying to hold on to this kind, caring girl that I raised, or at least uh, 
nurture and have her maintain these qualities because they're important to me and to her. She understands it, uh, not only theoretically, she understands it. She has very high emotional intelligence. Uh, but she tells me that to survive and to compete in this world, she needs to break away, like for me, like to cut this umbilical cord and when she communicates with me, she always uses this term boundaries, that I cannot cross boundaries that, uh, uh, you know, and I, and I'm, you know, this has been um, about two, two and a half, about two and a half, three years. So I'm always constantly working with myself and hired, uh, well hired, started being in therapy and uh, talking to somebody how to, like hold my reins, you understand? Because I feel now less so, but uh, it took me a long, long time. I was feeling constantly wounded and, uh, you know, thinking and working and, you know, looking through these uh, YouTube, you know, I don't know, seminars or whatnot. And I, um, I wanted to ask uh, your advice about it. You know, even though I'm already halfway or a certain amount of way there in accepting it, but it was very difficult in the beginning, very difficult because uh, I mean, I, I understood that I had, I understand that I have to let her go to mature and everything, but uh, I invested my entire life in her, literally. I didn't, I been with her on my own since she was about five, five and a half, I lost my mom who was a professional woman, a physician, when my daughter was like uh, slightly over four. And I I don't, in no way do I blame her, never mentioned it to her, but I was um, focused just on her. I mean, just how life was. I, I, I couldn't split my car to get married and maybe I didn't meet <laughs> the man that I wanted to, but you know, so, and, I definitely, under all circumstances, want her to be the best she can be. I'm not holding, I don't want to hold her back. I don't uh, dwell, you know, into her, you know, personal things and everything. I always think through dozens of times over before I ask her a question and everything. But how, how can I maintain my own? Um, I don't know how my gene it's, uh, you know, how do, you know, it, it uh, when she doesn't uh, respond to me or she responds in a negative way, it injures me so deeply, you know, and it's like my foundation collapses. I'm thinking I invested my life into this girl who is beautiful, bright, I paid for education and, you know, there's still some, you know, long, but anyway, and what, what, what I, you know, I don't want to say, what am I getting in return? Of course, you know, it was my idea and my desire to uh, raise a human being who can be an asset to society, which she is, which she will be, you know, and, and made. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nice if she showed a little appreciation. Yes. That wouldn't hurt at all. Mm -hmm. She's not. Mm -hmm. Because she still doesn't feel independent enough to thank you for giving her her independent life. But she mm -hmm. will. She will. In the meantime, just think about one thing. You're still the best thing that ever happened to her. She doesn't mm -hmm. have to admit it. You have to know it. Yeah. There was nothing uh -huh. in her life better than you. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the sacrifices that parents have to make for the children to be happy, yes. Um, all the sacrifice because they never pay you back. <laughs> yes. Except yes. their success is your is your nachas. Mm-hmm. So just know, you're the best thing that ever happened to her. Even if she doesn't know it, won't admit it, 
you know. Yes. I want her to have, I want her to meet somebody, you know, and she is beautiful and uh, not because she is my daughter, but it's very important, uh, you know, you, you, she's so focused just on her career. Yeah. yeah. And yes. She'll outgrow it. They yeah. all, mm -hmm. Sadly, they are disillusioned and disappointed. Mm -hmm. It's going to make their life wonderful, but it doesn't. So she'll be back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because you are the best thing that has happened to her. I hope so. Yes. Many years ago, I went to a doc. My mother took me to a doctor. Mm -hmm. I had digestion problems. This was an old-fashioned doctor. Mm -hmm. It was a dark office. I was really scary. It was eight. I was eight years old. The doctor says. What seems to be the problem? I said, uh -huh. my stomach. He goes into a whole rant. <laughs> a stomach is not a problem. If you have no stomach is a problem. Mm. So, okay, mm. okay, like, you know. Mm. Yeah. Not having a mother is a problem. Having a mother is not a problem. It's the best thing that happened to your daughter. <laughs> so. Mm. How long will it take for her to realize that? Um, she she, she, yes, she, she probably she, pro, she probably realizes it, but I understand because I, you know, had to compete in the outside, also tough professional world, and it's very difficult sometimes for an attractive, intelligent woman. I'm talking about my daughter now. It's even harder. You understand because you cannot. I understand that in a competitive world, you cannot show your um, your heart. You know, you have to keep it close. You cannot. You cannot show a vulnerability. Which she, she probably yeah. She thinks that whatever success she's going to have will be even more important than you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, be proud of her. And don't mm -hmm. expect any thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Well, if I get, uh, if, if hopefully, and she will meet a nice man and she will allow herself to open up this way, and I'll, she'll have children, will be my grandchildren. So that will be enough, you know, things, right? For me, I, I would hope so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If she makes you a bubby, that would be great. Yes. And I tell her she doesn't have to, well, not that she is planning to, but she doesn't have to meet or marry a millionaire, not that she is um, um, aspiring to, but I tell her uh, that the, the inner qualities, the human, you know, she has to look at a man, not at his degree, you know, his degree is not what she needs I'm for sure. one to marry. I'm sure she's she. not right. <laughs> I'm sure. Or she. his bank account. Well, his background, of course, but how he treats her, how uh, how they communicate, how he responds, uh, you know, when she experiences hardships. Yes, it's. Uh... I'm sure she knows that. She's your daughter. Mm -hmm. well, I hope so. No. I don't know. I don't see. I don't know if other people. We, we do not see ourselves objectively. Yes, doctor. We don't. Rabbi, pardon me. We we are. Yeah. We try to. Uh, but that's right. that's why it's good to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To get yes. another view of ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rabbi Freeman. Let's go to closing. Wow. What a share tonight. Whoa. I think everybody has to listen to it a few times over and over. Some people are having a hard time with that whole conversation with that woman. Like, it was so strong. It was so deep. But it was it was so powerful. I'm going to listen to it a few times myself. Okay. Again, first of all, Gracia Shkoyach for everybody stream for coming on tonight and giving tremendous chizik on a very important topic, relationships, dealing with people. And uh, tonight, Reverend Friedman, as usual, we, we go to the, we, go, we, we do root canals. When you come on, it's always a root canal. 
<laughs> so uh, if anybody's having pain, give it a few days, listen to it a few times. Don't worry, it got better, you'll get it clearer. Again, tonight's share is 154. If anybody wants to join the WhatsApp chat, so you get speakers, you get to see the the every week the speakers. You can WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066 to say my number. We can reach out to Menachem Bernfeld's website, menachembernfeld.com, sign up for his emails, send you the speakers, the replays. Again, if anybody's here the first time, Sunday night at 9 30. This is my this is my D. We have the best of the best, the best for bottom therapist topics. We covered almost we covered almost everything, not everything, but almost in the past four years. At Shem, August 27th, next Sunday, we're gonna have an amazing show with Rabitzak Schwartz, Schwartz. It's tremendous Lama Chacham, a big speaker. Um, he's from Givadze from Eretz and he's gonna come to really give us a lot of inspiration on getting into Rosh Hashanah, very deep, you know, the Haftar what El is, and really trying to get us ready for for the new, getting into the new year. And uh, let everybody know about it. Pass the word around. Let everybody join. Like Rabbi Friedman said, that's why we have these discussions here tonight, to really bring out points and to really review things and get physic. Everything that's shown will be recorded. It's on Menachem Berfeld's website. If you have any questions, um, you can email them at coachmenachem at gmail.com. Again, tonight's share is 154. If you want to listen to it on the phone, it's the number is 848-777-GROW. That's 848-777-4769. That show will be up hopefully by tomorrow. If anybody wants to get in touch with Rabbi Anas Friedman, he has a website. What's the website again? Let me see it over here. It's good it's to good, know. It's good to know.org. And that's how you can get in contact with him. Any questions, you could email him or reach out to him, book a session with him, and uh, you could hash it out. Again, thank you to all the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Ellen Ariel from Five Town Central, Hyla Kaufman. And I'm just going to say before we go to Menachem, then Ramanus, you'll, you know, after this two hours of deepness, you can leave us with a good. You know what comes to your mind in the next few minutes, but something leave us with something strong after such a share. But I just want to say tonight was very deep. It was very powerful. You you really covered a tremendous amount. I, I myself, I just feel like what what you brought out, what I heard is that at the end of the day, every person that made it and is here and is trying to grow, at the end of the day, there's something that does come. Whether you want to attribute some of it to your parents or not, they did bring you into this world, and there is. Uh, you don't have to have that relationship. You don't have to be that uh, martyr. You don't have to go through the the pain and the suffering. But being a mensch and doing the right thing is something for yourself. It's something that you need to do for yourself. It makes you a mensch. It makes you the right person. Um, and and just you know blaming everything on your parents and all the problems on your parents. Again, I'm not I'm not judging anybody or anything. But parents do make mistakes. People, parents come from different generations, and uh, parents come with their own gener generational trauma. We spoke about that a lot. And we have to accept that and understand that as well. And we have to make the most of it. And if we could, one of the questions is how do we break the chain? How do we, you know, how we break the chain is we work on ourselves. We go to therapy, we go to Rabbanim, we listen to Coach Menach, and we do things to self-help ourselves. And we become better person, better people. By us becoming better people, it's not only raising our children and doing the right thing for them, it's doing the right thing for ourselves. It's doing what we need to do for our parents, for our relationships, for the people that we have tainas on. It's about ourselves. It's about not living in the mud and being upset and being angry and being living in that negativity. And like also, Reverend Freeman, I just you, you said a very deep word. I just want to bring it out again. At the end of the day, we all have we all, we really bet some all have self love for ourselves. We're born with that. We have love for ourselves, even if somebody is suicidal, even if somebody's cutting themselves because they have feelings and they have pain because they love themselves and they can't tolerate the pain. If what I'm understanding is, if you had no love for yourself, you just wouldn't feel anything. You would just would you just lay on the floor and not want to get out of bed? There would be no movement, be no physical or mental movement. The fact that we move and Hashem gives us kaychas is because there is love and we have to use that love in a positive way to really help people and to help ourselves and to be forgiving to people and being understanding. And being forgiving to your parents doesn't make what your parents did right. And it doesn't make it, um, it doesn't make it, that it's going to hurt you. It makes it that you're a mensch and you're doing what's right. Whether somebody texted me, somebody that hasn't spoken to their parents in years, and the parents' birthday is coming up, should I buy them a birthday cake? So of course you should buy them a birthday cake. Why wouldn't you buy your parents a birthday cake? It doesn't affect you in any way. It's being a mensch. It's doing the right thing. Just because they did something wrong or they or you felt hurt from them, you can give love, even though you heard that that's actually the ultimate level. Robert Freeman, I said this many times. I, I think the ultimate thing people could do, and the people that I respect the most people that go through tremendous challenges and they use those challenges, people that lose kids and then they go be advocates for people that, that lose kids, people that go through trauma and they help other people with trauma. 
people that have been hurt and are able to process it, accept it, grow from it. It's a process, it's years and takes a lot of work. But then they're able to re-love or at least do the right thing with it. That means that you're really an unbelievable person. You're able to take the stuff, accept it, and grow from it, not just live in the misery and blame and hate and be negative. Because if you're still living in that, again, I'm saying my personal opinion, you could hate me for saying it. I'm, I'm going to get hate mail for it. But at the end of the day, if you're living in that, that means you're still the Edson really doing the generational trauma in a different version. They did it to you. You're doing it to them. You grow from that. Not only you, everybody's busy with their kids, but do it for yourself to become a better person. So that's my takeaway from what 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 I heard tonight from our Friedman, which I thought was very, very powerful. And for the people that are having a hard time hearing some of those comments, and missing the validity, that the validation and all that stuff, which is we do a lot of that, and therapists do a lot of that. Validation is great, and we need to validate, and we have to understand people's feelings and people's pain, and we're not unvalidating any of that. But Robert Friedman is what I'm understanding is taking it to the next level. Okay, now that you had the pain, now that you had the tsar, nobody's disagreeing with the abuse or whatever you went through. But what you're doing with it? What are you doing with the love you have? Who you are? Where are you taking that? Are you taking it to say that because I went through something, that's why I get to a tour from doing the right thing or doing what's mental or doing what's what's human decency? Or am I saying, no, I'm going to do the right thing in Kulza? So that's my 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 takeaway from tonight's share. Coach Menachem, wrap it up. And then Ramanus, leave us with something. Knock it out of the park again. Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yeah, I want to thank you, Rabbi Manus, for tonight. And like we heard, Usher, you covered it in a few words. Um, it was triggering, it's triggering for many. And the concepts that you bring up many times is hard. For you, Coach Menachem, the person that he was th that I had a conversation with texted me just now. I actually feel a real appreciative for his depth and his response, and it helped me a lot. Okay, continue. So again, many people, when they hear these concepts, uh, you have a koya of taking a way of thinking and turning it over. Now, many people have worked on this for a long time. They're getting the help they need, and... Uh, the people should get the help they need. And yes, it could be hard to understand these concepts. But the many concepts that we discussed tonight, you know, whether it was self-love or parents, no matter what they did, whatever concepts came up, I know people messages from all the sides that, you know, for many it's hard. And I'm val validating. But to listen to it again, meaning there is depth to it. And it, it's, it makes sense that it might take time till you understand it. The, the concept till you understand, you might not understand it the first time. So, so thank you very much. And Amit Hashem, again, for those who got physic tonight, beautiful. For those who feel they didn't yet, Amit Hashem, Hashem should help them. They should have the koyach to continue wherever they are, the healing process that they're on. And hopefully one day they'll get to a place, a better place. That they will be able to understand themselves how they should be able to continue. Amen. Hashem. Sashkoyach and Atfila. Uh, everybody should continue growing wherever they are. And one thing that you mentioned, it's there's always you could pat yourself on the back, like you you know you might hear you shouldn't be so busy with yourself, but look at yourself. Look at what you're doing. You might not see it because you're sitting in that negative thought the whole time complaining but by hearing what we heard tonight or by having the right therapist that can show you the work that you're doing you should be able to continue and Mitzvah Shem Dash should be able to help you grow so thank you very much Manas I normally always end the joke you know I always start with the joke with you you're, you're Avram Fried's brother you're this one's father Benny Friedman and the eighth day and the Gans Mishbach and I always say but a nigger but this time I don't want to nigga. This time I want a starker wrap up, a real, real wrap up. But one of the benefits of all of this is that when we think of ourselves as parents, we know we're not going to be perfect. Hopefully, we won't be as bad as our parents if our parents were were not were not smart. But we're not, you know, we're going to have some regrets and we're going to make mistakes. And so here's. Here's the approach that is healthy. I'm not going to be a good father, but I'm not going to quit being a father. I'm not going to be a good son, 
but I won't quit being a son. I'm not going to be a good husband because what it takes to be a good husband is almost humanly impossible. What it takes to be a good father, what it takes to be a good uh, Jew, it's almost impossible. These things we should not try to be good at. We should just try to be consistent. Don't ever stop. Don't stop being a Jew. Don't stop being a father. Don't stop being a mother. Don't stop being a daughter. Don't stop being a son. Don't stop being a husband. Don't stop being a wife. Don't be good at it. Just be at it. That's all God asks. Thank you. What, what's that again? Romanus, thank you again for coming on. It was it was a very, very powerful share. Which I hope it gets passed around a lot. I hope, I hope you upload it on your channel also. And um, I think this share is really going to help a lot of people. And I'm going to say everybody next week, same time, same place, 9.30. For Rabbi Yitzhak Schwartz from Gavad Zev. And Rabbi Freeman, as usual, we got we to we gotta cover so many more topics. Rabbi, Rabbi Freeman, question for you. We're going to end off with a question. Can I ask you a question? Now that you're Coach Menachem, let's get real regular. Tell me what, what your thoughts are on the shear and what, what do you what do you take away from it on the program? Well, the whole structure is very fascinating with the you know with the voting for the, the most important or the most whatever significant. It's it's unique. And I am I'm absolutely certain that a lot of people are better off now than they were two hours ago. So take credit for it. You're doing a definite public service. In some cases, it's even pikuach nefesh. As you know, you're actually saving lives, improving lives, changing lives. No question about it. Thank you, Eric Freeman. We love you. Zayge benched. Zayge Take care. Bye-bye.